friends, this is Scott Pauley, and I'm thrilled you've joined us for the Weekend Pulpit. From time to time, it's my privilege to share a Bible message that God has used to affect my life in a unique way. And today's message from God's Word is from a guest preacher and someone that is very special to me. I hope you'll get your Bible and follow along as we listen for the Lord to speak to our hearts. Now then, the genealogy goes on down through the chapter, now chapter 4. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, what Jesus got there by the waters of baptism, he still has. It was not just an outward symbol, was it? But he now was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in John 3, the scripture says that God gives to the Son, not the Spirit by measure, we're measured. We're so limited. We have so little room. We take so little time to pray. There are so many frailties that hinder us. But Jesus, the perfect, sinless, blameless one, to him was given without measure. And Jesus take full of the Spirit all the time from then on. All right, so now Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he was tempted and defeated Satan with the word of God. Now, verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He still has the power of the Spirit. What Jesus got in fullness, he still has. So he went into the fame of him through all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He was accustomed to going to the synagogue. He was accustomed to reading the scriptures. When he was 12 years old, he had been up to Jerusalem asking questions of the scribes, and they were astonished at his answers and his questions, and they and stood up to, for to read. They said, he's the best reader we've got. He likes to read. And they, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He turned over to chapter 61. And uh, looked at verse 1. Listen to it now. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable ear of the Lord. And then he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It's written back in Isaiah that when the Savior comes, the Spirit of the Lord God will be upon him. He'll be anointed to preach. And now he said, This is the first time you ever saw it. I've been coming here yet 30 years, he said. You never saw it before, but the scripture's fulfilled today, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he started his public ministry, isn't it? All right. And they bear all bearing witness and wonder why they said, This don't sound like Jesus. Why, I've known him all these years. I've seen him in the carpenter shop lots of times. He's made plows and things, and, and look at it. Well, this, and they wondered and at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if something happened and people say, that's not the same man. Wouldn't it be wonderful a lot of people said, oh my, well, they're just entirely different and they marvel at the grace of God on your speech. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So it is with Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, all right, so Jesus filled the Spirit, began his ministry. By the way, we drove into Nazareth last March, drove into Nazareth and stopped in yonder's the hill. What's that? That's the hill of precipitation. What do you mean, the hill of precipitation? Well, all of us who know the Bible know that means that's the place to hear Jesus. Now, fill the Spirit. Thirty years he's been here, very popular. Thirty years, didn't get drunk. He always told the truth. Always did good work in the carpenter shop. He always went to the synagogue. He was a good reader. He, never, he was a model young man. Never did wrong. Everybody likes him. Now then... Thirty minutes after he spilled the Spirit and began to preach to him, they rush on him and rush him out of town and try to throw him down that cliff and kill him. People don't get persecuted because they're Christians. They get persecuted because they're Spirit-filled Christians. People don't get persecuted because you pay honest debts and quit getting drunk. You get persecuted because you're on fire for God and you just keep talking all the time trying to get everybody saved. You see that? 
All right, so Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, wasn't that a wonderful day when Jesus stood up there and read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Here it is in the Old Testament. This uh, Here it is. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. And so he started preaching and the power of God on him. And everybody wondered. They said, good night. Isn't it strange how he talks? Well, he's been coming here all these years. And they wondered at the gracious word proceeded out of his mouth. All right, I'm saying Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit and gave his witness. Now, uh, hear all the work of Jesus. And he's our pattern. If he was filled with the Spirit, it's silly for me to suppose I can do what he did and not be filled with the same Spirit. If he had miraculous power, it's silly to suppose I can do what he did and not have miraculous power too. You know that? He kept people out of hell. If I'm to enter into that ministry and be partners with Jesus, and the work I do shall you do also. And as my Father sent me, so send I you. I've got to have what Jesus had. You know that? Jesus is our pattern. Let me tell you, on this matter of the Holy Spirit, you can settle all the important questions about fullness of spirit and about tongues and about, air, and about sanctification and the witnessing. Everything's involved. If you just find out what Jesus had and what he did and how he got it, and you know then what we ought to have and what it'll do for us and how we can get it too. For Jesus is our pattern. How be baptized? Like Jesus was. How am I to preach? The work I do shall you do also. How am I to be, have reproach? Uh, let's go unto him without the gate, bearing his reproach. If the world hated me, it'll hate you also. Well, how am I to be filled with the Spirit? Like Jesus was. And what's he going to do for me? What well, did for Jesus? He's my pattern. I'm to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. You see that? All right. Now let's see then. How was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, there are two short, simple things. First, he was baptized. What does that mean? Baptized? That means Jesus said, I'm heading toward Calvary, up that way of sorrows. I'm heading toward that time. The Father will turn his face away from me, and I'll hang there in agony six hours and die. And then and Joseph will take me and Nicodemus and wrap me in spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And they'll take me down that little hill, and through that garden and by the wine press there at Gordon's Calvary, and they'll put me in that, in that hole, a stone cave, a cut out of stone Nicodemus had there. And I'll lie there three days. And the third day I say, oh God, roll back the stone from the door and sat on it, and I'll come out, Jesus said. So Jesus said, I'm giving myself up to die. When Jesus was baptized, it meant crucifixion and death and resurrection. That's what a picture, that's what baptism pictures for us. And for you, it ought to mean this. When you were baptized, it ought to mean this old man I used to be. I'm going to count him dead. Let's bury the old fellow before he goes to stink any more than he does now. Let's bury him. And buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Raised to walk in newness of life. Not now for self, for Jesus. He died to save sinners and rose to save sinners. So I'm, I'm buried and risen to save Je sinners too. Now take up your cross. What for? To get sinners saved. That's what Jesus' cross was about. And so anybody says, I'm, I'm going to be baptized. Jesus was baptized. That meant this. Let's put it in these words. He gave himself up in perfect obedience to the soul-winning plan of God. And that's what the fullness of the Spirit's about and for. And nobody's ever filled the Holy Spirit for other purposes. And that, all right, so Jesus was baptized. And that meant he gave himself up to die for sinners and get sinners saved. And so, you know, it's a remarkable thing that again and again in the Bible, the fullness of the Spirit is connected with baptism. That does not mean that going down in the water and coming up may, guarantees you be filled with the Spirit. That means that what baptism means ought to make you fit to be filled with the Spirit. If you understood it, did you really say goodbye to the old world? Did you really say this old wicked sinner, he dead, I'm done with him, I'm going to live. Oh, you know, he'll be up ruling the roost again if you don't look out. But did you really mean that? All right, the Lord says, if you're really saying goodbye to your own ways, and now Jesus, just to live for you and get people saved, then you're ready. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one cometh after me uh, who baptize you with the Holy Ghost, he said. 
and it's told in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke and in John and then the first chapter of Acts Jesus repeated it he said John through the baptized with the water but she should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since and so there's connection so people are baptized if it means what it ought to mean well then that's a part of the condition not the baptism but the heart attitude of surrender to the will of God about that you know Peter said them um, in Acts 4.32, he said, We're witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God giveth to them that obey him. See? Them that obey him. So when Peter preached at Pentecost, the men came and said, Oh, what do we do? They didn't say what to do to be saved. They said, We want that. We want the rest of it. We want what all you got. What is it? We want that. How do we get it? And Peter said, Repent. Then you get saved. And be baptized, every one of you, referring to that, pointing to that, representing that, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, he said. For the gift promises to you and your children to all that are far off. You remember in Acts chapter 19, there were a group of disciples, about twelve, over at Ephesus, and they'd been saved. Their disciples, Apollos preached to them. And Paul came, and he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, No. Well, Paul said, What about when you're baptized? Well, they said, we don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. They said, didn't know about that. Apollos is here. You know, he wasn't here at the Pentecost. He don't know about that. He just filled the Spirit himself, but he didn't know what to tell us. Well, Paul said, uh, that meant when you're baptized, you're supposed to be filled with the Spirit because you lay your life on the altar for Jesus. And when they heard that, they baptized again. And Paul laid his hands on them and prayed, and they filled the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't misunderstand me. Baptism doesn't guarantee you be filled with the Holy Spirit. But what baptism means is one of the conditions. The heart attitude you ought to have if you're baptized, that's what the condition is. I give myself up to this business of soul winning, this old sinner dead, my money making, fully on that, living for pleasure, never mind. I'm going from now on live like Jesus to get people saved, you see. All right, last one, what else? And he prayed. Jesus baptized and praying. Baptized and praying. What does it take to be filled with the Spirit? Ask for it. Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? All right. God gives the Holy Spirit to those that ask. It's in the present tense, continuing to those that ask and ask and ask. Well, as Jesus just prayed, it was your time. But Pentecost, they prayed ten days. Yeah. Because Jesus didn't have to do any emptying, you see. Jesus didn't have to do any confessing. And a lot of us uh, out in West Texas used to have, uh, oh, we had rain every now and then. Uh, I don't remember hardly anybody ever grew to manhood without seeing a rain, at least once in West Texas. It, um, and it always rained every now and then. Um, and so, but not very often. We hauled water up and put it in the cistern and so on. But when it rained, the ladies always wanted to catch some rainwater to wash their hair and wash pretty things in and so on. And so we have down spots. First of all, first rain got to wash off the dust off the roof because lots of sandstorms. And then, uh, now then, turn the water into the old barrel. But good night. That old barrel's got broom weeds in it and then there so on. So clean it out, okay. Now I don't know what it, yeah, and the water squirts out all around. It's drying up four months since it's been in the water in that old barrel there. And it squirts out all the cracks. You've got to tighten down the hooks, you know, and get the thing soaked up and so on before it holds water. That's why you don't get filled immediately with the Holy Spirit, maybe. You've got to clean up a little bit and get the hooks tightened a little bit and so on. So you leak pretty bad, you know. But Jesus filled the Spirit with asking. The Pentecost... There's Peter, and he's praying up in the upper room. They fasted and prayed and prayed. And Peter said, Lord, <laughs> Lord, you know I just lied and denied you. I'm so sorry, Jesus. And Peter had, I don't blame the Lord. I'd have kept Peter on his knees longer than that. <laughs> and then James said, Lord, we want to be big shots. We were asking, I want to be on the right hand. I want to be on the left hand. And they said, Oh, Jesus, never mind. And make us willing to be anything but pills of the Spirit. And there's Thomas. Thomas said, Lord, I didn't believe it. I thought you were dead for good. Even when I saw you, I didn't believe it till I put my fingers in the nail prints and my hand in the side. Lord, take out this old wicked unbelief. Yeah, I can understand why it takes a good while for them to get filled with the Spirit. And you too. See? Yeah? Praying. 
That's one of the conditions, full of spirit. We say, aren't you afraid to be a fanatic? <laughs> oh, God, give us some good old fanatics. <laughs> I'd sure love to see some. I'd sure love to see somebody. Real, real crazy about getting filled with the Spirit. Yes, sir, I would. They've turned the world upside down. Come here also. I'd like to have some world upside down turners. <laughs> Get started around here. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Oh, they said, we told you not to talk in that name. And look what you've done. You filled Jerusalem with the doctrine. I sure wish we had some good old Jerusalem fillers with the doctrine. And I started around here. I wish somebody would just get plumb crazy about being filled with the Spirit and the power of God and keeping people out of hell. Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. Well, see, now, look here. I don't want to waste any time about this. I will to give a few minutes, but I don't want to be any fanatic. Well, the Lord said, you go on your way. The Lord Jesus said, took me 30 years away from home in heaven, living in poverty, despised and rejected. It took me with the traitor's kiss on the cheek and the bloody sweat of Gethsemane and the shame of Pilate's court and then beaten with the Roman scourge, cat and nine tails, and then the crown of thorns and mock, and then up the Via Dolorosa, that way of sorrows carried across. And then stripped naked, nailed her cross, and mocked me six hours while it died, and God turned his face away. Well, the Lord says, you want it easier, then I don't need you. You go on. I'll get some fanatic, some holy roller. I'll get some friends, somebody a little off about things, not very smart. I'll get somebody else means business, God said. You just go ahead. Don't you think so? Don't you think so? Yeah. All right. Friends, over the praise. All right, you want the power of God? Here. Jesus filled the Spirit because he gave himself up to the life that meant death and crucifixion, resurrection, and all for souls. And now then he prayed, and so can we. Now let's see. Here are some lessons, and what are, briefly, some lessons we may learn from Jesus, our pattern. Well, first of all, first of all, Jesus never tried to do any work at all for the Father until he filled the Spirit. The Lord Jesus, can't you think he said at night, Lord, I'd like to get started. Can't you think he said, my father, I've been 30 years, my, I'd like to see the golden streets again. If I could only hear the angels sing, they love me so much, Father, and I've been away 30 years, and I haven't won a soul. Don't you suppose Jesus said, but Jesus said, I'm not going to start until it's right. I'm not going to do it until I have the anointing for it. Jesus did no public ministry until he's filled the Spirit. Don't you think it must be an awful abomination to God? I got a seminary degree. <laughs> I know how to make a homiletic outline. I got a nice book of sermon illustrations. I can get me some good illustrations and so and so. I can make a literative outline. Beware of that fellow. Um, I don't, don't you suppose God gets awful tired of folks just because you've been to college and because you got smart and because you read some books and so on? Don't you think, God, because you got a slick tongue? Listen. Our lightning rod salesman got that. <laughs> That's not so much. Listen to me. Don't you suppose God gets awful tired of people rushing in where angels fear to tread uh, and walking on holy ground rough shod without pulling off your shoes? Don't you suppose God gets awful tired of people grabbing in with your culture and your degrees and your homiletics and your holy voice and... Maybe a collar turned backwards and, and the board of deacons back of you and a good salary and the uh, uh, denominational secretary, he boosts you. Don't you think God gets awful tired of that stuff but people who don't think about the power of God? Don't you think so? You remember Nadab and Abihu, sir, the sons of Aaron, the priest? God said, now they're anointed. They take them now and they're bathed in water and they put on the fine linen garments, every one. And they put on, they put on the, the breastplate and the garments and the linen breeches and, and all the other clothes left outside. And God said, now you can start the altar here. Don't put any fire on it. I'll furnish the fire. And you put the wood and you put the sacrifice. I'll furnish the fire. Oh, they said, that's okay. We're not to build a campfire. And they got a shovel and went and got some coals of fire from the camp. Put it in here, you know, and, and maybe took a Stetson hat or maybe they took, uh, um, old turkey, turkey wing fan. You ever have them at the fireplace in the country? You city slickers, you don't know enough me to tell you anything. <laughs> and, uh, and fanned it, and the fire started, and so and so, and God killed them both. God said, I said, I'd fix the fire. Got too much human fire around. 
got too much brains, got too much logic, got too much education, got too much denominational approbation. You got too many things that not from God. You better say, the Lord said, I want to work the miracles. Just try to get anybody saved without a miraculous change. Just try to get anybody into a preacher without a miraculous anointing of God. Just try to have a revival just by announcing and uh, sermon subjects and ads in the paper and the banner across the street and so on without the divine intervention, the breath of heaven. I guess the Lord gets mighty tired of that. He killed me to have him to buy you. And the elf came in and looked pretty upset about it. And Moses said, don't you say anything about it. God will kill you too. Uh, don't you think it's a pretty good thing God quit killing preachers that start trying to do it with human fire? A lot of you people would be dead, wouldn't you? Jesus didn't start preaching until he was in order to preach. At one time, years ago, I made a vow to God. I make it again tonight. I made it many times. I made a vow to God I would never go to the pulpit again without waiting on God and asking and pleading and claiming an anointing from God on me. I'd never try to preach in human wisdom and human personality. Oh, what we need is the power of God. Jesus never preached until his anointed preached. Isn't that pretty good? Here's another thing. What happened when Jesus filled the Spirit? He started out getting people saved, preached in the power of God, witness. So you say, well, now here, I believe you're talking tongues. Jesus didn't. He could talk the Aramaic language. That's what the rest of them all talk. What's wrong with that? In Toronto, man, I preached to 1700 one night and had 15 adults saved. And the man stepped up to me and said, uh, Brother Rice, you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost? And I said, well, if you mean a breath of God, that's helped me to have some part in tens of thousands of sinners being saved. Yes. He said, I didn't mean that. I mean, if you talked in tongues. I said, I talked in the English tongue tonight. Could you understand it? He said, yes. Well, I said, it didn't seem like everybody else could understand it. He said, yes. Well, I said, what's wrong with that tongue? What's wrong with preaching so somebody understands you and gets saved? What's wrong with that? You know? Huh? What's wrong about the kind of tongues to do somebody some good and honor Jesus Christ instead of showing you're so hot? Huh? Jesus, um, no. He said, what kind of sign? Well, if you have the power of God, and that's sign enough. You say, what kind of sign to have at Pentecost? Well, I'll tell you. They say, how did Peter know it filled the Spirit if it wasn't the tongues? I'll tell you how Peter knew. They counted them up. Oh, boy, look at those converts. They come up here dripping wet out of the water. Whoo, you line them up. Here they go. That's 2,986, 2,987, 2,000. Whoop, that's 2,990. Whoop, go on, five more. 2,995, 2,996, 2,997, 2,998, 2,999. 3,000! Peter said, boys, this is it. <laughs> Any time you have something like that, you can say, I got it. <laughs> and if you don't have somebody saved, why don't be bragging, you don't have it. Oh, but just, I just felt as light as a feather. Jesus didn't. Oh, but you say, something just took over and I said things I don't understand. Jesus didn't. If Jesus didn't need to, you don't need to. Isn't that all right? What's wrong trying to be like Jesus? What's wrong trying to have what Jesus had and work like Jesus did and love sinners like he did and weep over them and get people saved like Jesus did? What's wrong with that? Or oh, so Jesus is our pattern filled with the Holy Spirit. Someone said, well, I believe it. Filled with the Spirit means sanctified and getting better every day. As good as Jesus Christ and getting better every day and better than all the Baptists and all the Methodists and Presbyterians. <laughs> No, Jesus didn't feel that way about it. No, Jesus didn't need to get sanctified. He's already perfect and sinless. He didn't have any eradication. That's a nice big word, isn't it? He didn't have any eradication of the carnal nature. He didn't have any carnal nature needed to eradicate. If Jesus didn't, that's not what Jesus got. That's not what I'm getting. I want what Jesus had, the power of God. I was baptized like Jesus on a cold November day in a big old earthen tank out in Archer County, Texas. I thank God sometimes I've preached in the power of God like Jesus did 
in some tens of thousands. Thank God. Drunkards made sober, harlots made pure, infidels made into saints of God, convicts and murderers and Catholics and Jews and Hindus and Muslims and Parsis. Thank God. And I know what Jesus had. I'm mighty poor, but I'm one of his. And I've got a right to ask for what he asked for, and I've got a right to have it and use it, the power of God. All right. Jesus is our pattern, filled with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, oh, do thy mighty work here. I think people ought to make a holy vow tonight. I will not go on without the power of God. I can have it. It's promised. There's nothing like the preaching of God's Word to bring comfort and conviction at the same time. I wonder, what will you do with what you've heard today? We would love to hear from you and pray with you. You may contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. That's enjoyingthejourney.org. I hope you'll be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church wherever you are this Lord's Day. And then join us as we continue our devotional study of the Word of God on Enjoying the Journey in the New Week. May God bless you. Thank you for listening.